The sword is one of the most important weapons of all time. From the earliest parts of the Bronze Age, the sword has been all important, and this was no different in the Middle Ages. Most swords during the early part of the Middle Ages were forged out of bronze, copper, and iron. Later swords were made out of smelting iron into steel. The scabbards were usually made out of wood or leather. The inside of the sheath was often lined with fleece or fur. In the early Middle Ages, many Germanic warriors were buried with their swords, so many swords from the Middle Ages have been discovered in graves. Swords also served as an important status symbol. The sword of a noble could be elaborately decorated, especially the sword's hilt, which could contain inlaid gold and precious stones. Even the scabbards could be decorated in bronze or gold. Swords were so important that they were often given names during the Middle Ages. We see this in the epic poem Beowulf. Hruntin was the name of a sword given to Beowulf. Now, at the beginning of the Middle Ages, there was a transitionary period in terms of sword technology. The main sword was based off the Spatha, which was a Roman sword. Now, during Roman times, the sword was often used for military purposes and gladiatorial games. The Spatha was a type of straight and long sword. Around the 10th century, the use of properly tempered steel started to become much more common than in previous periods. Around the 9th to 11th centuries, we see the Ulfbert swords. These swords are distinguished by the fact that their blades are inlaid with an inscription. The inscription is thought to be some sort of trademark, which was used by different blacksmiths. The knightly or arming sword was one of the most widely used swords during the Middle Ages. The sword was essentially a straight, double-edged weapon, which was wielded with a single hand. The blade length was usually around 70 to 80 centimeters, or 28 to 31 inches long. They were most heavily used between the years 1000 and 1400 AD. The most distinguishing mark on the knightly sword is the cross guard. The cross guard was the bar of metal between the blade and the hilt. A further development was the long sword. These had a cruciform hilt and were usually gripped with two hands. The length was around 85 to 110 centimeters long, or 33 to 43 inches long. It was widely used during the late Middle Ages and early Renaissance periods, approximately between 1350 and 1550. The skill of the weaponsmith was all important. An excellent smith could combine the right ores to produce swords of fantastic quality. The basic method for making swords has stayed the same for thousands of years. First, you need iron, and you get this by smelting iron ore. In order to smelt iron ore, you need some very intense heat. In order to produce this extreme heat, you need a forge, or in those days, they were called bloomeries. Today, we call them blast furnaces. But the basic concept is the same, extreme heat to smelt iron. Now, initially, the first swords were made of iron. But over time, bladesmiths realized that if they added a small amount of carbon to the iron, the iron would then become purified, and as a result, this process produced an alloy known as steel. But this was not an easy thing to do, and only a highly skilled bladesmith could master the technique of creating steel. Also, steel was incredibly difficult to harden. It involves a process called quenching. This process involves steel being rapidly cooled while also maintaining its overall structural integrity. So early in the Middle Ages, the process of making steel was not well understood. But later in the Middle Ages, weaponsmiths became much more skilled at making steel blades. And of course, steel blades had a huge advantage over iron swords. It is more durable, stronger, and lighter. The mace was also widely used during the Middle Ages. Maces typically used a heavy head on the end of the handle to deliver a powerful blow. The shaft of the mace was usually made up of a heavy wood or strong reinforced metal. The head of the mace was composed of iron or steel and was usually shaped in a knob. The mace, of course, was a blunt weapon. The main object was to deal an impact blow rather than achieve the penetration that a sword offers. This is why in many instances, maces were the more effective weapon against plate armor. And the reason for this? Because maces can cause damage without having to penetrate the armor. Since maces were relatively cheap to produce, peasants could wield them against a knight or heavily armed warrior. A variant of the mace was the Morning Star. The Morning Star usually consisted of a ball of iron or steel and was studded with projecting spikes. You can see it closely resembles the mace. You can also see here the sharp spikes that surround the head of the weapon. There were many different types of pole arms used throughout the Middle Ages. There were spears, lances, pikes, but the basic parts of the weapon are the same. 
The polearm was a close quarters combat weapon, which was distinguishable by its long shaft, which was usually made of wood. The extreme length of the shaft gave the soldier an extended range, and therefore a greater striking power when the weapon was swung. It could be used for stabbing, thrusting, or even slicing. Polearms, like maces, were cheap to produce, and therefore became the favored weapon of peasant formations. Chroniclers will tell us that polearms were originally used to carry barrels of grapes in the vineyards. Who knows about that? But apparently someone got the bright idea to convert them to a weapon, so heads of iron and steel were fixed to the top of the polearm. And once again, since the weapon was primarily made out of wood, they were very cheap to make. The peasants could then use their polearms against an invading enemy, or even in an insurrection against their lord. You can see that in this illustration right here. Polearms were not just used by peasants. Later on, professional foot soldiers used them against armored cavalry. The polearm was the favored weapon of the Swiss footmen, who used them quite effectively, decimating entire cavalry units. They usually knew exactly where to strike an armored cavalryman. Eventually, the polearm became so highly valued that it was often picked as the weapon of choice for parade purposes. Polearms would be elaborately decorated with their shafts often covered in velvet. Color guards for both the British and French army in the 18th and 19th centuries often carried the polearm in parade. A long bow is a type of bow that is very tall, sometimes almost equal to the height of the archer. This added height allowed for a fairly long draw. During the Middle Ages, the English were famous for their longbowmen, and they used them with great effectiveness against the French cavalry in the Hundred Years' War. For this reason, it was one of the most important weapons in English history. The longbow forced the cavalry to change tactics and to move to heavier armor, that plate armor which we have talked about in previous videos. Now the crossbow is a type of weapon also based on the bow, and it consists of a horizontal assembly mounted on a stock. It shoots projectiles called bolts or quarrels. The medieval crossbow played a significant role in warfare. One advantage the crossbow had over the normal bow was that it required a lot less training, so it was easier to equip your armies with. Another advantage of crossbows was that they could be kept half-cocked and ready to shoot. This gave the crossbowmen precious time to achieve a greater aim. The main disadvantage was the slower rate of fire in comparison to the bow. A medieval chronicler wrote that 12 arrows could be discharged to every bolt in the crossbow. Still, crossbows were considered an essential part to any medieval army, especially during the Crusades. Carts that were usually behind the army carried all the darts and quarrels for the various squadrons of crossbowmen. Also, some crossbowmen were mounted, but the majority were on foot. Crossbowmen often carried a large shield which they could plant into the ground. The archer could then fire the crossbow from behind the safety of the shield. Now, similar to normal bows, crossbows wreaked havoc against armored cavalry formations. For this reason, ranged weapons, and especially the crossbow, were looked at with utter disdain by knights during the Middle Ages. In fact, Pope Innocent II, in April of 1139, issued a papal decree banning the use of crossbows against Christians. But if you wanted to use this unfair weapon against the infidel, that was certainly okay. In any event, by the 13th century, crossbows were widely used, especially since they could neutralize even the strongest of cavalry units. Richard the Lionheart, an early adopter himself, was reported to have killed several enemies wielding the crossbow. Eventually, crossbows were replaced by firearms, which we will talk about in a later video. I was going to talk about axes, but we are going to discuss that topic in the next video when we talk about the Franks. This video is going to end the prelude part of the series, but before we move on to the timeline portion of the series, I will leave you with an interesting tidbit. A manuscript was discovered containing a list of expenses for the maintenance of Rudland Castle in Wales. This was for the years 1281 and 1282, and the expenses were paid by King Edward I. Now, I should point out that this list was mostly for ongoing daily expenses of the castle. However, there were some expenses that had a time range. But the writers during the period rarely used regular dates. So instead of writing from September 9th to October 23rd, they would rather use other important events. And many times this involved feasts. So it would read something like, from this feast to this feast, we will pay this person this amount of money. They must have really loved their feasts in those days. Okay, so the knight received 12 pence. In our time, that equals a whopping 17 cents. That's not even enough to buy a McDonald's cheeseburger. Of course, 17 cents in those days went a lot further. 
The squire was paid the same rate as the knight that he served. The archer only receives two pence. We have to remember, though, archers had far less expenses than knights and squires. The captain of the archers was paid double the rate of a normal archer. He was usually in command of a contingent of 20 archers. And a crossbowman received two pence. There are entries for numerous other items as well. Masons, plumbers, carpenters, smiths, a charcoal maker, a plasterer, eight cartloads of lead, two men to repair the road leading up to the castle. The road was all important after all. You needed to keep that castle well supplied. And 160 spreaders of hay. Yep, apparently that was a big deal in the castle, as there are a lot of entries about hay. And here they are. Six carts and three horses that each day will carry the hay in from the surrounding meadows. Seventy-seven men are allocated for preparing, raising, and raking the hay. The hay is then placed in a storage house inside the castle. This is referred to as the hay house. What an original name. And there is even money allocated to repair the hay house in case any damage is done. And this is interesting, locks to fasten the bars of the town and castle at night. Nighttime was dangerous, so most towns and castles were on lockdown during the night in the Middle Ages. And finally, last but not least, and perhaps the most important entry, the queen must have her boat. 